Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm gonna play this video and talk about things that are going on, the better claims going on, and talk about things that I think that are being done right and are done wrong. All right, so this was an incident um, that occurred at a community outreach type of event. Um, the community outreach event was put on by a group called Urban family and this urban family group uh, they focus on youth programs neighborhood safety and family support and that these pop-up events that they do give away food toys and clothes to the community now I haven't been able to find a whole lot of information about these events as terms of like videos of people at the event and what's going on during normal times um, I see photographs um, at some of this uh, family outreach or family, whatever it was called, group. And some of it kind of gives me an idea of what could be going on, but at the same time, some of it doesn't uh, give a clear indication of what could be going on. So um, I'll play the video and then I'll talk a little bit more about uh, this group and this event going on. but. Uh, basically, there was a shooting that occurred at this event, and some people were injured, and no arrests have been made in this uh, incident at all. But let's go ahead and play the video so you can see what's going on there. We're going to need additional units likely from out of precinct to assist in securing the scene. It's rather large. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. You got the face? Hey, we're rolling on his side. That's the hurt arm. 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 That's the How old are you? Okay. You're okay. I promise you're okay. Okay. Ma'am, do you know where you're at? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're doing great. You're doing a good job. Okay? This is gonna feel really tight, okay? Fine. You're doing great. Oh, yeah, right there, man. They got to wait for you to get here to make sure no one else is. Hey, Omar, put over radio that safe access is going to be from the gas pumps. From the gas pumps, okay? Okay, ma'am, I need you to uh, yeah, sit up like that, okay? Keep your hand right there. Let me see what's going on here. He's got a, looks like a grazed wound that opened up his mouth. His okay. airway, airway's still solid. He's breathing. I just, we put some combat gauze and then wrapped it for pressure. Yeah, okay. Do me a favor. Listen. You know where you're at, okay? You're well aware of what's going on. You're doing great. Trust me, okay? I promise you're doing great. All right? Where is he shot? So what do you, what do you yeah, think he's doing it? really good. Okay. Let's keep, keep I got a, I got a, I got a pressure bandage. You want me to wrap that up or no? Please. Leave it like oh, this. Oh yeah, you have one on you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll hold it. Yeah, hold that. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Ah. Whoa. Excuse me. Medic is going to use that for action. Medic 20 has good position in the parking lot. Additional medic units can stay next to them. This is a shot from the legs, very well secured. Uh, you're doing fine, sir. You're doing fine. You're good, bro. You're doing good. I'm chilling, bro. I'm here doing what I, I'm here doing what I do. Doing what I do, bro. Okay, so. 
Hey, I got hey, directed him over here. Where's he hit? On the side. Just side? Okay. I can move it too much, okay. We need to turn here. Get outside and no, we're good. Get outside and direct fire in. I right, direct him over here. Sit, Chuck's okay. right now. You got it? Okay. Yeah, you're, you're, good. you're good. You're good, bro. You're good. Just keep I'm good. Good. You don't got to act as good. You're good. good. You're good. Yep. Breathe, bro. Breathe. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where are we going? Left, left. 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 Okay. Oh, I'm on his side. So, as I said, this was supposed to be some type of community outreach type of event uh, put on by this group called Urban Family. So let me go real quick to the Seattle Times. Dozens of bullets were fired at a community outreach event late Friday in Seattle's Rainier Beach neighborhood, injuring five people. A pop-up event to provide food and services in the South Seattle Seattle neighborhood was underway when shots were fired, Police Chief Adrian Diaz said at a news conference at about 10.30 p.m. Honestly, this is really disturbing when you have victims that were really just trying to do an outreach effort, trying to help people get people on the right path, and this is what they end up getting hit with. Investigators believe there were at least two shooters, but no suspect description has been released. Here's what we knew about the shooting. The shooting took place 9 p.m. in the 9200 block of Rainier Avenue South in a parking lot where the event is held every Friday near what was once a King Donut shop. Dozens and dozens of bullets were fired, said Diaz, who responded to the scene Friday, as did Mayor Bruce Harrell. A 24-year-old woman and a 25-year-old man were taken to Harborview Medical Center in critical condition. They were in satisfactory condition Saturday morning, according to the hospital spokesperson. Two other men in their 20s were treated at the hospital. One was discharged and the other was expected to be released Saturday. A fifth victim, a man in his 30s, according to police, was treated at the shooting scene. Diaz said it was not immediately known if the victims were targeted or what unfolded before the shots fired. No suspects have been identified. The shooting is being investigated by SPD's Gun Violence Reduction Unit. Police are asking anyone with information to call, blah, blah, blah. Chantel Patu, Executive Director of Urban Family, a group that focuses on youth programs, neighborhood safety, and family support, said the Friday event often gives away food, toys, and clothes to the community. Patu came to the scene after her group was contacted Friday to aid police in their investigation by managing the crowd and helping people affected by the shooting. With shootings occurring so often in Seattle, she said, it's time for the community to do more and for parents to look inside their homes at what their kids are doing and what they're going through. This act of gun violence at an outreach event meant to be a safe place for South Seattle neighborhoods or neighbors is appalling and unacceptable, said Harold in a statement posted Saturday on the X platform. There are too many guns in hands where they do not belong, and we can never accept this violence as a normal fact of life. City Council Member Tammy Morales, who represents District 2, including South Seattle, said in a statement that her office will be, take, will be talking with others to work toward comprehensive and evidence-based solutions that will prevent such tragedies from recurring while addressing the significant need for mental health resources to address the trauma of this event. Let us unite to build a community where we resolve issues in a restorative way and in service to one another. May we find solace in each other's embrace and strive towards a future without gun violence. Two weeks ago, three men in their 20s were shot a few blocks away from Friday's shooting scene in the 9,000 block of Seward Park Avenue South. No arrests have been made in that shooting. Last weekend, two men and two women were shot early Sunday morning during a street racing event on Capitol Hill near Broadway and East Pike Street. One of the women, 20, died at Harborview Medical Center, according to police. The woman's family identified her in an online crowdfunding campaign as Essence Najee Green. No suspects have been identified in either of the shootings, with an alarming uptick in gun violence in the 
lead up to summer, the Seattle Police Department in June created a community violence task force of officers and detectives pulled from units across the agency who will target people responsible for the shootings. The task force, composed of about 50 officers, is focusing efforts on four areas where violence is widespread. Aurora Avenue, downtown, the Central District, and the city's south end. Seattle police investigated 55 homicides in 2022, up from 41 the previous year. 54 people were killed in Seattle homicides in 2020, 20 more than in 2019. Seattle Times staff reporter Daisy Zavala Magana contributed to this story. All right, so uh, they're already in a violent area, and this event is going on, and I would suspect that this event attracts a large amount of people. Look at all these tents right here. There's a bunch of tents, um, a bunch of chairs, and I would also be willing to bet that there was a DJ here. There was probably some music being played that attracted the people here. There's food. Of course, uh, people are going to come out to this event, and they're already in a violent neighborhood. That means there's violent people there who do stuff like sell drugs. <laughs> and will come here to see potential customers to sell these drugs to, or just come out for free food and drink. It's a free party, right? And it's probably playing music that they like because it looks like, most likely, uh, the people at this event would be listening to the music that those criminals would also happen to like. And I'm talking about rap music. Followers of rap music, rap culture, hip hop culture, are predominantly more likely to be involved in incidents like this. You do not see emo kids who listen to goth music getting involved in shit like this. You don't see people in country music genre get involved in stuff like this. You certainly do not see people of classical or opera music getting involved in shit like this. Who gets involved in shit like this? The rap and hip hop crowd. It's facts. It wasn't really clear about the property they were on, but personally, I think that whoever is in charge of that property is going to be need to be held responsible for some of this. Um, they're attracting this large crowd there, and I guarantee you they're probably not having security there at all. Probably not having any security there. This Safeway, this Safeway has security, but their security is not going outside dealing with that stuff. They're not even capable of dealing with that stuff. Look at this girl right here. Tiny little girl with a security shirt on and has yoga pants on. Fucking high water yoga pants at that. What was she going to go out there to some shooters and really shoo them away? Like, Get on here, get on out here, guys. You can cause some trouble. Bye bye. I hell no. I'll fucking laugh her out. They'll shoot her and laugh her ass out the parking lot. She's just there for loss prevention purposes, to make a presence in there. And she's unarmed. I don't see a duty belt. I don't see a gun anywhere. So she's not able to do anything. If stuff spilled inside, like I don't think this person was shot inside this door. I think he got shot and ran in here, and this is where he fell down at. Yeah, she ain't got no duty belt on. She's got yoga pants on and a and a security shirt. So even if the violence spilled into the store and there's a shootout in the store, what's she gonna do? Not a damn thing. So if this event even did have security, I guarantee you they didn't have proper armed security. If they had any security at all, it's probably unarmed security. Or they was probably having some people there as um kind of like bouncer kind of people, just dudes wearing t-shirts or, you know, hell, they might have not, might not even been in uniform. They might have just been there to, you know, go de deal with people. But I even doubt that. Like, uh, I seriously doubt that. Um, so no telling what kind of other problems have been going on at these kind of events. 
and the police probably don't get too involved in them because you know the police can't be seen as racist going hanging out in these events don't want that happening so what happens when these events draw large crowds and they are unmonitored with no enforcement whatsoever they become lawless people feel emboldened to do stupid shit and this is what this is what has happened there's no defined no defined boundaries there's no way to keep out undesirable people it is a free for all anybody comes in does whatever they want they can come in overly intoxicated there's no one there to say they got to leave it is true just it's a free for all lawless kind of environment and i would say that this is a nuisance type of event a nuisance property and the property owner needs to be, I think, held accountable for this kind of nuisance being there because uh, they allow this to happen. They should have got with these people who are going to hold this event, uh, ask them how many people are going to be coming into attendance and asking them, what's your security plan? What are you going to do? What are you going to do to keep people protected on this property? And if they can't come up with a good answer on that, then the property owner is negligent. I really hope that the victims sue the shit out of the property owner for negligent security, and I hope they sue the shit out of this family outreach group, whatever the hell it's called, for again, negligent security, for attracting a large crowd of people in a dangerous neighborhood at that, and not having any, any adequate security in place. Like, you're just asking for trouble at this point. <clears throat> So we see he has a, um, a medical pouch here. Let me hit the mute on this because I can talk through it while it's playing. Uh, this medical pouch right here, he has a, uh, a cutting tool on this uh, device right here. You can see it right there. Let me back it up a little bit more, get a good freeze frame. All right, so this is like a seatbelt cutter type of device right here. It has a, a razor blade recessed inside this protective housing. Um, and he's able to cut through the clothing pretty easily with that. I think that's a pretty cool tool to be able to have. It, it cuts through the, the thicker webbing of a seatbelt with ease, and it can cut through clothing with ease. I don't know how well it will do against a, you know, like a full leather belt or anything like that, but most people just aren't really wearing like really true full leather belts. Uh, so I think most belts it should be able to cut through. Uh, but if not, as a good fail safe, there should be a good set of EMT shears in any type of medical bag to be able to cut through thicker clothing. But these type of cutting devices are optimal in my opinion. Um, he has uh, an assortment of stuff in there. We see what looks to be like multiple pressure dressings. He's got tourniquet in there. Uh, so this is a blowout kit pretty much of what he's got. It's not a first aid kit. It is a blowout kit. Look, you see another tourniquet in there. One, two. It looks like you got three more tourniquets in there. These are probably chest seals. So this is a this is a true trauma bag right here. I highly doubt you're going to find band aids in this bag. And there is a difference between first aid kits and trauma kits. First aid kits are what I normally call boo boo kits. They have things like band aids in them, tweezers, stuff like that. Trauma kits need to have stuff to deal with real, true traumatic injuries, such as bullet holes and knife holes. A band-aid is not going to fix, or not fix, but a band-aid is not going to help a bullet hole. It ain't going to do shit. <laughs> you need pressure bandages. You need compressed gauze. You need tourniquets, etc. to deal with that kind of stuff. And this is the kind of bag that's set up to be able to do that with. So I like that set up there. It would make for a good active shooter response bag or mass casualty bag so it doesn't even have to be a mass shooter thing it could be like a wreck on the interstate and there's a bus of people who've been injured so a bag like that would be a great setup to be able to help a bunch of people who are all injured so i <laughs> so he puts this pressure bandage on and one thing that I thought was kind of interesting is after he gets this thing uh, 
tightened in. <laughs> he fucking pats the leg, pats the leg with a gunshot in it, and pats on it. <laughs> don't don't do that. <laughs> It's like patting someone on their broken arm, like all right, putting a putting putting their arm in a sling and then patting their arm, knowing it's broken. Like, come on now, who does that? Not really a whole lot to say about the medical response. Um, you know, when it comes to medical stuff, uh, you need the knowledge and the gear, right? Um, so most agencies to meet that accreditation process, uh, they'll provide first aid kits and all the vehicles. It's a check box kind of thing. As I noted earlier, uh, first aid boxes are not the same as trauma bags. They're just not. But agencies who want to meet an accreditation will just put freaking first aid boxes in vehicles. Some agencies may get some extra money and they may you know, equip officers with trauma bags and stuff like that as an extra added benefit, but it's usually not the first go-to option for many places. They just wanna check the box and say, hey, all our vehicles have first aid kits, our station has first aid kits, we do this, this, and this, and we are accredited. We're an accredited agency, yay! Which means absolutely jack shit. So, um, if your agency does not provide things like tourniquets and pressure dressings and whatnot, that's gonna be on you to, to go get that stuff. And I know, like, law enforcement, you're having to buy all your all your shit, right? Well, that's the nature of the beast. Do you remember that interview that you had as a peace officer um, or applying to be a peace officer and they ask, you know, why you want to be a cop? Because you want to help people? There you go. That That's, that's your answer on why you need to go buy your own shit because you want to help people. If you're saying, fuck it, I ain't buying it, the department can provide it. If not, people can bleed out then you lied during your interview. You're not really there to help people. You're just there to look cool in a uniform and take fucking Instagram photos and talk about how you fight the evil that the rest of us pretend doesn't exist. If you think you're too good to go buy your own tourniquets, buy your own trauma stuff, you don't need to be working in this profession. You need to move the fuck on somewhere else. Um, but yeah, so if your agency's not, agency's not providing this stuff, you need to be buying this stuff on your own. And... Not only do you need to be having this equipment on your own, but you need to be getting your knowledge of this stuff because most agencies will do a checkbox kind of thing and they will only provide CPR, AED, first aid type of training. The first aid block of instruction that comes with your CPR, AED classes is very basic and does not go into the extensive coverage of how to utilize tourniquets, how to utilize chest seals, nasopharyngeal airways, etc. It just goes into how to wrap a bandage around somebody's arm, how to put their arm in a cravat, how to assist somebody with taking their oral glucose or their albuterol inhaler or their epinephrine pen. That's it. It's very basic first aid stuff. It does not go in depth into pre-hospital trauma care the way it should. If you uh, are lacking in that field, then the field of study that you need in terms of pre-hospital care is uh, what is known as TCCC, Tactical Combat Casualty Care. That is a style of medical training that is more realistic in the approach of dealing with gunshot wounds, stab wounds, etc. Unfortunately, most agencies do not provide that. So again, you're going to have to seek this stuff out on your own. Go back to what I just said about what your interview was like, why you said you want to be a police officer. You want to help people, right? If you're not doing the thing that can help other people, you lied in that interview. I'm a firm believer that if you're going to carry the tools to induce trauma, you need to carry the tools to reduce trauma. If you're going to carry a gun for a living, that means you realize or recognize the fact that you can be involved in the gunfight. If you're going to be involved in the gunfight, you need to recognize the, the reality of the matter that bullets go both ways. A uh, gunfight is a two-way range. You could be shot, your coworkers could be shot, or an armed citizen, your family could be shot. So you need to know how to save a life. And when we look at the reality of things, being involved in a shootout is a pretty damn low statistic. You are more likely to come across victims of a car wreck than you are to be mugged. 
So it honestly, realistically makes more sense to have medical gear and training before having a gun and gun training. Whoa, what a concept, right? All right, that's it. I can't think of anything else to talk about for this video. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you have not already, hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.